Nearly three years ago, we did a radio installation or how to wire a radio properly. What we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna take you through another radio wiring and we're gonna show you when to use a harness and when to use an interface, what wire colors do and how to make your connections both in color and the way we do it here. So the first step in wiring any radio is obviously to figure out what car you have. What I mean by that is you need to make a determination as to do you need a harness or do you need an interface. There's a big difference between the two. An interface is typically used in more newer vehicles and generally those that have a factory amplifier. The reason for that is many of today's newer vehicles have data bus systems. So in the old days, you would turn the key, one wire would go to 12 volts and turn on the radio. In most newer vehicles, that's actually done through a data bus signal. So you won't find a wire that actually turns on with the key. Instead, it sends a series of signals and the data bus decodes those signals and then tells a radio to turn on by providing the power to the radio to turn on. You'll need to create that and to do that, we need an interface. Now, some vehicles can still get by with just using an ordinary uh, wiring harness and those connections are relatively straightforward. When using an interface, the connections are a little bit more difficult, but ultimately they're the same. So we're gonna take you through on how to wire each one. As you can see, we have two harnesses. Both harnesses look very similar. However, there's one distinct difference. One uses RCAs, one uses speaker levels. This factory amplifier uses the same type of signals that an aftermarket amplifier does, low level signals. This vehicle doesn't have a factory amp, so we're gonna use the amplifier in the new radio to drive the speakers and just make our speaker connections. We have quite a few wires, and we'll go over what the actual wires do. So we have a yellow wire. What this is, is a constant, meaning this is a direct line to the battery. What this does is actually provides most of the power to the radio and provides memory backup. Then we have a blue wire. That blue wire is a remote turn on or power antenna. This provides 12 volts out and that signal actually comes from the aftermarket radio. What this wire will do is either trigger a power antenna, trigger an antenna amplifier or trigger the factory amplifier. Then we have two green speaker leads. These are the left rear, green being the positive, green black being the negative. Then we have two purple speaker wires. This is the right rear, purple being positive, purple black being negative. Then we have our black wire, this is ground. Then we have our red wire, this is accessory or turns on with the key. This is what actually triggers the radio to turn on. Next we have our white speaker pairs. These are the left front channel, white being positive, white black being negative. Lastly, for our speaker wires, we have the gray set. These are the right front, gray being positive, gray black being negative. And then finally, we have the orange wire. The orange wire is typically an illumination wire. In some vehicles, it's called a dimmer wire. Occasionally, you'll see a orange and black wire labeled dimmer. Typically these have the exact same function, however the dimmer may actually adjust up and down between 0 volts and 12 volts as you make an adjustment to your interior dash lights. That's the difference between illumination, typically illumination is 12 volts only, either on or off, and dimmer is actually a rheostat, it goes up and down. In our previous video, we showed how to make a connection using crimp connectors, specifically butt connectors. Now, some people like to use crimp caps. They do yield a slightly better connection, but what we really like to do is actually solder joints, typically because they will not come apart like butt connectors, whereas you could actually pull one of these connections apart, and these are susceptible to failure. And we'll show you exactly how butt connectors can fail. So we'll just take a simple piece of wire, we'll make a simple strip, we're just gonna put the two wires in and crimp them, and then I'll try to pull it apart, and you'll see it'll fail relatively easily. So on this one, we're just gonna pull, and you can see it breaks right apart. And generally, when I actually make a connection with a butt connector, I actually bend 
the front portion of the wire in. This actually prevents most failures, but I'll show you that you can actually still make one fail. So when placing it, you can see we actually only go about halfway through the butt connector, bend over the wire, put the wire in, make our crimp. Do the same thing with the other side. Now for most, this is actually a, a fine connection and you can see I'll be able to try to pull pretty hard and I can't get this to come apart. Now, I however have been able to pull the insulation back, which is dangerous. Now the wire failed. Either method of crimping actually does work and it's not likely that it will fail, but there's always a possibility. And how often do you really want to tear apart a dash, whereas you could have just soldered it and it will never come apart. One question we get asked a ton is, should I cut my harness that comes with my radio? Of course you should. What you need to do is actually trim this down to make it fit behind your dash. Now, some things you don't wanna cut off are a noise filter. It's there for a reason. You could cut it off, it's not wise, probably lead to some engine noise. You also do have an inline fuse for the accessory wire, probably should leave that. Should you cut the wire on the constant? Well, you could, it's likely that the vehicle has a fuse on this wire as well, generally of almost the same size. I'm in the habit of not cutting these off. I can wrap it in such a way that it's not a problem for me, um, but I will go ahead and make all the other connections, cut them to length, and then generally loop this one through something similar to this. That way we'll cut it right here, make it to our metro harness. So now we'll solder the connections. First thing we do is cut our wires to length to make our life easy. Next we'll tape up our power wires, the red, yellow and black, up to the noise filter just to kind of clean that up so we can make our speaker connections and all our other connections just a little bit simpler. We use our favorite Tessa cloth tape, links in the bio. So all of our connections are meticulous. Now we're gonna cut our heat shrink all to the exact same size. It's a bit overkill, something we like to do though. And we always retain the first one that we cut. That way all of them are the exact same length. I usually start by doing the power wires first, then the speaker wires, then the remaining wires. 
Before we tape any harness, you can see we have some extra wires that are left over. Now, in our example, we're using an old Panasonic harness. And on this harness, it actually has a dedicated remote turn on out and a power antenna out, which is this blue wire here. And it says ANT, so we're not gonna use that. What they call side brake is actually the parking brake. Typically, if we had the signal in this harness, we would make the connection. The parking brake is usually ground and you actually need to make that connection at the parking brake. Or for those of you that wanna bypass it, it's up to you. Those of you that have a double din or navigation radio, you're gonna have a reverse wire, a vehicle speed sense, and a parking brake. Now VSS, that's actually a pulsed signal that goes up and down with your speed. Those can usually only be connected at either the speedometer or with an interface. And then the reverse wire. The reverse wire on a double din or a monitor radio for that matter will actually trigger the backup camera. So this will need to be either made somewhere in the kick panel or actually at the reverse light. So in our example, we're not gonna use any of these three wires, so we're gonna tape them off. And now we're gonna go ahead and clean up our harness to make it look nice and make it easier to tuck behind the dash. Once again, we'll turn to Tessa and we'll go ahead and start taping it up. And just to make it look extra special, we have two exposed wires. We're gonna tape those too. We made it easy for the sake of the video and just use a simple harness that's pretty basic. This only applies to vehicles that have standard audio systems. And when trying to do a harness like this, it's much the same, just the RCAs. Now, when using an interface, you generally have considerably more wires. And that's because of the design of the interface. And this interface actually has steering wheel control as well. But our harness, for the most part, is the same. So this will plug in at the vehicle side. This will plug into the actual controller. And then we have our wires. So on this one, we have red for accessory, yellow for constant, black for ground, RCA on this, it may be the auxiliary in that's in the center console, or it could actually be to the subwoofer, a 3.5 millimeter to the steering wheel control on the aftermarket radio. And then this one uses actually speaker level connections to the rear speakers. And on this interface, there's another harness that actually comes from the output of the controller that contains all the other wires. So your red wire, your uh, front speaker wires, your illumination wires, remote turn on, th that type of thing. All the connections will stay the same. The only difference is now you have an interface in the middle. Some Metro harnesses will contain wires that you won't use. One in particular that kind of pops up a lot now is brown for mute. Your radio may support it, your radio may not. If it doesn't, you simply tie it off and don't use it. Now that we have our harness complete, we can go ahead and plug this into the vehicle, and then this would plug into the radio. Some people have mentioned they've made all these connections and their radio won't turn on. What could be the problem? Well, the first thing you do is plug this in and begin testing all of the leads. If your radio is not turning on, you only have three wires to test. You have your ground, you have your constant, and you have your accessory. First one being your yellow for constant, make sure you have 12 volts on that. Your ground, use a continuity check, test for ground. And on your red wire, which is for accessory, you'll use a voltmeter to test for 12 volts. One surprising question we get is, do I even need a harness? Well, technically you don't. The one thing you'll face though, is you'll need to actually test every single wire because there won't be wire colors that match those in the aftermarket. Whereas the aftermarket harness makes this really easy. And the aftermarket typically maintains the same color standard, both on the radio side and the interface side, making wiring much, much easier. So in our interface, we did this as just a simple radio change out. Now, if you have aftermarket amplifiers, you're gonna actually need to bridge out or tee off 
a remote turn on lead to turn on those amps. We didn't do that, but in the same harness, which is the blue wire you can see right here, and in the harness we have it back here, you would just run a lead to your amps. You would want to use a disconnect, namely because if you ever had to pull the radio out, you would want to be able to disconnect that one wire. Another thing that this harness doesn't touch on is if you're running multiple amps. You would run your RCAs from your aftermarket stereo to your amplifier. Now, what do you do with the speaker level outputs from the amp to the speakers? Well, there's a couple things you could do. One, you could run new speaker wires. We have a video that you can watch on that or what some people do is run four wires from the amp to this harness. And what they will not do is make the connections from the aftermarket radio to the speaker connections. They'll actually take the four leads from the amplifier and connect them to the aftermarket harness, thereby using the stock speaker wires to actually power the speakers. When choosing not to solder connections, you can either use crimp caps or you can use buck connectors. Now, buck connectors typically come in one of three sizes, yellow being for 10 and 12 gauge, blue being for 14 and 16, red being 18 through 22. So you'll need to size accordingly. We generally use the blue because most of the time it's between 14 and 18 gauge wire, both on the aftermarket harness and the fact or, or the aftermarket radio harness. Hopefully this new video helps clear some things up, provides additional insight. Subscribe if you're new, click that like button, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Quality Mobile Video, and thanks for watching.